astonish you if I said that depression and anxiety cost the global economy $1 trillion per year in lost productivity. It is a startling statistic reported by the World Health Organization. Hello, everyone. My name is Rajiv Jairaman. I'm the CEO and founder of Nolscape, and I welcome all of you to another episode of The Learning Curve, powered by Nolscape. To understand the subject of mental health and humanizing the workplace in detail, I have possibly the best person to talk to today. Rahul Verma, a global HR leader, a speaker, a thought leader whose career has been dedicated to helping people thrive at work and making a positive impact on businesses and society. Rahul is currently serving on the board of directors of Sapien Labs. In his earlier stint, Rahul was regarded as the architect of Accenture's revolutionary approach to performance management, where he led the team to deliver one of the biggest organic growth stories in the world when Accenture Technologies revenues rose by 45% and the employee base grew from 255,000 people to 375,000 people. Hi, Rahul. Welcome to The Learning Curve. Thank you very much, Rajiv. It's uh, such a pleasure to be with you. Thank you for having me. So Rahul, we'll um, get started with a quick uh, rapid fire section for you. Are you ready? Sure, sure. Let's go. What's the first thing you do every morning to set a positive tone for your day? Great question. Um, and I, I do three things uh, every morning. Um, the first is uh, that uh, my my literally my my first interaction once I'm out of bed is with my dog. I have a 14 and a half year old German Shepherd who's you know now positively a senior a senior dog and uh, just spending time with him is is joyful. Um, next, I uh, take care of my body. So I have about a liter of water, which uh, lukewarm water with uh, which I mix with a few things, and uh, that's the first thing I ingest just to detoxify uh, from from the previous day. Uh, and third, um, as I did uh, before our, our talk today as well, uh, I started doing transcendental meditation um, about 14 or 15 months ago. Uh, and uh, that's a practice that I do twice a day on most days, uh, 20 minutes each. Uh, and uh, that's pretty much the uh, the the way I can just gain equanimity and uh, and and settle down my nervous system and be ready to to take on the day. Wow, that's an awesome list. Thank you so much for that. And what's one word to describe a mentally healthy workplace? Joyful. Awesome. And uh, what is the biggest misconception you've come across about mental health in the workplace? Well, Rajiv, great question. I have spent a, cu a couple of moments on this. Um, when people think about mental health, um, our mind typically goes to thoughts of depression, anxiety, stress, suicidal thoughts, etc., uh, which is how most of the world understands mental health. Now, that is absolutely a key part of it, but it's not all of it. In fact, it's not even the biggest part of, of mental health. Um, so to re-anchor to the World Health Organization definition of mental well-being, which is uh, the ability to be able to function and not just feel, being a positive contributing member of the society, being able to deal with the regular stresses of life. And so that actually includes several other dimensions in addition to the emotional aspects, such as mood and outlook, or um, there are aspects such as the social self, how we relate to each other uh, and other, uh, other beings on the planet, uh, cognition, our ability to bring the best of what we have uh, mm -hmm. mentally uh, to, to, to our work, mind-body connection, the impact of our physical state on our ability to function, uh, adaptability and resilience, drive and motivation. So it's a much broader um, uh, definition that we need to anchor to, to truly understand what is going on with our people uh, with the uh, objective of being able to actually improve the human condition. Awesome. Great. Uh, the next one is uh, adventure or calm. What refuels you? Um, calm before the adventure, I think is uh, how I would put it. Um, I, I, I like to, to be able to gather my capacities and uh, come from a place of equanimity. 
um, but um, I would describe my 30 year career as a, as a series of adventures. And uh, um, much of what I've done through my life has been just taking on big transformations. And that gives me a lot of joy. It gives me, I guess, the adrenaline going. And, and I think I need that um, as much as I do need the calm. Awesome. And it's a related next question. What's more important for happiness, passion for work or work-life balance? And there's a lot of debate these days about, uh, you know, the 40-hour work week and some leaders uh, not choosing to work after 6 p.m. or, um, you know, others in India saying, you know, 70-hour work week should be the norm, um, right? So uh, keeping that in context, what's more important for happiness, passion for work or work-life balance? Well, so th this is, as you said, a raging debate, uh, but I don't think it's the right debate. Um, so when we do what we love to do, what gives us meaning, do it with people, we enjoy doing it, and find gratification in what our work does for others, for our customers, for the society, for um, you know whoever is the constituency that we serve, then really um, the need to draw boundaries around it uh, becomes less important. It is not that by doing too much of that, uh, we are actually diminishing our capacities. Now, of course, if we stretch it beyond reasonable limits, and if that's all we do, and we don't take care of uh, our body, our mind, if we don't care of, take care of our relationships, if we don't discharge um, our, our, our duties and obligations to, to others outside the workplace, of course, that can be detrimental. Um, so I don't think work-life balance uh, is a concept to anchor to. At the same time, passion is great, but there is something that goes beyond passion. And it, 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 you know, when you get, become zealous about something, then it, it, it crosses those boundaries. Um, so what we've actually learned is that things like relationships and meaning, um, both of these have a huge, huge impact on our uh, I, I, I'm, I'm not anchoring to happiness in specific. I think happiness is a right. state of mind that can that can change. You can feel happy at times and not happy at times. Uh, but when, what I'm really ha anchoring to is what makes us of sound mind, of good mental capacity, of good ability to function and contribute. And I think for that, um, it, it requires us to be able to do our work, but do work in a way um, that uh, that fulfills some of the other things that I'm saying. Awesome. That's so wonderfully put. That was a great rapid fire section, Rahul. We'll now move to uh, a more detailed discussion. Right. So be to begin with, um, tell us about your uh, growth story at um, Accenture, where you played an instrumental role for bringing in the, the new performance uh, mechanism and so on uh, for our viewers and listeners. Um, that'll be a great backdrop. Thank you so much for asking, uh, uh, Rajiv. So I think uh, I, I was actually privileged to uh, uh, be part of uh, the Accenture story in, in maybe uh, two or three um, uh, big parts of my career. So really the first time that I was involved in, in, in hyper growth and Accenture was uh, when I was the HR director for India. And uh, in, the, in the first seven years of our growth, 2001 to 2008, uh, where we uh, back then used to be a small little boutique consulting firm, very well known in India and very well regarded, but still small in the large scheme of things. Um, and then um, I, we uh, went public in 2001, decided, made a big move into technology and then into operations. And that whole thing kind of played out in India. And the seven years that I was there, we grew from 200 people to 40,000 people in what wow. became the largest organic growth story in the world at that time. And uh, there's a Harvard, uh, Harvard Business School um, uh, case study that's still taught uh, on, on how that happened. So that was the, the first uh, involvement in growth. And then the, the next one was uh, right towards the tail end of my career when I was the chief HR officer for our technology business globally. And um, uh, I took that role on just before the pandemic set in. And um, and then through till for, for about two and a half years when I was in that role, 
um, well, first thing in the pandemic, uh, the world collapsed like it did for everybody, and uh, right. there was a great deal of suffering, and and uh, and and it impacted our business significantly. Um, but rather than kind of shutting down, one of the things that happened was we decided to um, use that opportunity to actively upskill our people in technologies that we saw would become important later on. So we did the world's biggest, we called it new skilling at the time, the world's biggest reskilling of people into future digital technologies, which then fueled the growth for the business as uh, we, I think we grew from about 25 billion to 36 billion in, in, in the technology side and, um, and, and a very large employee growth. So the, the growth story was, uh, I, I, I was, I was very privileged to see that first from a country lens and then from a global lens. Um, but then also, like you mentioned, I've, I've had the opportunity to do some big transformations um, as the chief learning officer, bringing in several innovations um, in, in learning into Accenture, which is something you're very passionate about. And that's, I think, how we first crossed paths. And, and then I was asked to reimagine performance management. Uh, and that's what brought me from Singapore to New York, where, where I still reside. Uh, so, yeah, it's been it was a fun journey and, and, and some big, big adventures along the way. Yeah, what a story, right? Um... What experiences, both personal and professional, led you to prioritize mental health and employee well-being uh, in your leadership roles and eventually um, your current work with Sapien Labs? What actually led you to that? Yeah, so there's a couple of things um, that kind of have profoundly informed my journey. Um, the first is a, is a personal, on the personal front, uh, I was born with a debilitating condition of bronchial asthma, and this was, I was born in Delhi, and I grew up in Delhi, and so on, um, and um, and at that time, asthma was not very well understood, or it wasn't prevalent, now it's ubiquitous, of course, unfortunately, um, and um, what happened was, as I came out of, uh, came out of adolescence into adulthood, and uh, out of a very restrictive childhood for those reasons, I, of course, started to feel like I'm bulletproof and, uh, you know, did everything that I shouldn't have done. Um, and then uh, in my working years, I mentioned the hyper growth years in India, uh, I, of course, plunged full on into work and it was exciting and it was um, challenging and all of that. And I think for, for, for a seven year period, I just kind of went at it full throttle, completely disregarding my health, completely disregarding kind of any healthy habits and so on. Um, and what that resulted in was the, that my asthma returned and it returned quietly at first and then uh, more profoundly. And then uh, between uh, 2005 and 2008, I had three serious attacks and the last one uh, almost killed me. Uh, it uh, led it to a cardiac arrest and I was gone for two minutes. Um, and when I came out of that, the question for me was, well, why? Uh, why was I spared? Why, why am I still here? And... Um, the only answer I had at the time was, well, I'm here to help people thrive. That's why I chose human resources and that's what I have to do. But to do that, I need to take care of this, uh, this system. Uh, I need to be mentally uh, energized. I need to be physically healthy. I need to be emotionally fulfilled and I need to be spiritually grounded to my purpose. Um, and I've since called that human expansion uh, of, of being able to, uh, to be able to, uh, experience health along all these dimensions through the course of work and through the course of study. Uh, and so that kind of became my purpose and it was the guiding force for me to do everything that I did subsequently. Uh, and, and I was fortunate enough even to, as, as I came out of that condition to be able to take on bigger and broader responsibilities in my career and live in different parts of the world and work with uh, professionals from all over the world. Um, but then, also professionally, what I what I noticed was um, that in the pursuit of organizational objectives and growth, um, we can over rotate to a condition which takes us to juicing every ounce of productivity of every single day, every single minute that we can. Um, and I started seeing this when I started uh, seeing that we were doing, you know, very large scale work. Uh, I was seeing um, uh, distributed teams around the world uh, working extraordinary long hours for extended periods of times. And it was just kind of relentless. Um, and, 
and I was seeing people suffer. I was seeing senior leaders suffer. I was seeing, you know, people across suffer. And for me, the question was, well, there's got to be a better way. Uh, why can we not have uh, achieve human expansion for our people through the course of the work so that not only do we achieve organizational objectives, we do that through people thriving. And um, through everything that I've seen uh, in my own career and in studying high performance environments across different dimensions, um, I've come to realize that it's possible. There's a science and art of being able to achieve that. And that's what I'm more and more focused on now. That's an inspiring story, Rahul. Thanks for sharing that. Uh, so at Nolscape, you know, we've had long chats about this in the past as well. Um, you know, we do a lot of work on digital and digital transformation and future readiness for the longest time we used to define in terms of digital readiness. Uh, but during the pandemic, it became very clear that there seems to be a correlation between all the digital stuff that we are doing and the decline in mental health. So over time, all the keynotes uh, I was doing, uh, I found myself including a slide towards the end saying, okay, digital is all good, but let's take care of mental health as well, right? So, so whatever you mentioned right now uh, strikes a deep chord in me, uh, right? So, uh, and I've uh, come across the, uh, the Global Mind Project. Um, I'm familiar with what uh, you're doing. So maybe uh, you could throw some light on what that project actually is and um, the, the the, the re research also shows that mental well-being has declined globally by 24 percent since 2020, particularly among the younger generation. Right. So, how do you see this trend, and in that context, what does humanizing the workforce mean to you? Well, Rajiv, thanks, and 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 I just want to first kind of pause and um and and, and compliment you on how you have prioritized this um, both for Nolscape uh, and for yourself. And uh, this is what I think has bonded us um, and, uh, and, and hopefully will uh, lead to us uh, doing more and more work together in, in this dimension. Uh, but what I have seen you do personally is, is important and it's worth noting. And I don't know how many people know that. So I'm, I'm just going to mention it over here. Um, you know, you, 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 you lead with, with a deep sense of purpose. Uh, learning was always very important to you, so I'm I, I'm not surprised that in all your keynotes and uh, uh, you talk about uh, uh, about the digital, but you're finding yourself getting more and more drawn right. to um, uh, to to what can help humans uh, be able to function at their best, and that's what mental capacity really is all about. Um, but also the work that you do uh, on yourself every single day, uh, your pursuit of qigong and uh, and how you're getting that word out there uh, in your own personal capacity. So that's very inspiring to me, as I'm sure it is for all the people that are fortunate to experience you. Thanks, thanks, Rahul. Outside Nolscape. Uh, now, you, you referenced the Global Mind Project. Um, uh, so let me kind of talk a little bit about that. Um, the genesis of the Global Mind Project was um, the founder, uh, Dr. Tara Tyagarajan, and a team of scientists uh, who have dedicated themselves to studying the human brain and mind at scale. Um, and they wanted to know, based on the WHO definition, what exists out there that, that tells us about how humans are able to function and how everything that's going on in the environment is affecting that. Um, and they studied 126 assessments only to realize that there was not a single one that was actually anchored to the WHO definition of mental well-being that could tell us about human capacity to function. When you think about it, it's crazy, right? So they created a measure. It's called the Mind Health Quotient, the MHQ. And in the four plus years since its launch, um, it has now been taken by almost 2 million people in over 70 wow. countries around the world. It's out there in 17 languages and growing. Uh, and it's basically growing at 1,500 to 2,000 people a day. So it's the, now the largest and fastest growing database in the world. Um, I've been fortunate to be up close with it as a board member in Sapien Labs. And uh, there, there, there are a few things that, that stand out in what we are seeing. So you mentioned you know, the pre-pandemic to the post-pandemic. And what, what our data is showing us that pre-pandemic, about 14% of the people in our database were distressed or struggling, which is at the lowest end of, of the scale. That number jumped to 30% in 2020, and four years hence has kind of flatlined. 
which means we are seeing no, no real signs of recovery. And now that database is bigger and bigger. And so, so, so that's concern number one, that the human capacity, the human mental condition has declined without signs of recovery. The, the second um, is that there's a direct correlation. We published a scientific paper recently on this, but there's a direct correlation between mind health and productivity, pretty much one-on-one. -on -one. So your ability to, to show up for work, um, what we call absenteeism, or your ability to be present at work while you're there and be able to focus and, uh, and achieve what you set out to, which we call presenteeism. So both of those aspects decline based on where your mind health is. Um, and so if you kind of look at a typical Fortune 500 organization and look at what's a, what's the average payroll and say, okay, maybe it's, you know, conservatively $50,000 uh, a year, uh, it, it'd likely be more. Uh, and then you look at our database, which shows us a significant decline. You would see that on a per person basis, we are, all, we are losing a pretty large figure uh, and then you have multiplied by, let's say, the average size, which would be maybe 5,000 people in a 50,000 organization. We are talking about a multi-million impa dollar impact currently on productivity, which leads me to my third big point. Um, and you referenced this, the, the impact on younger generations. For the first time in recorded human history, we are seeing that every younger generation is worse affected with Gen Z, the you know eighteen to twenty four um, uh, year old generation, being three to five times worse off than the older generation, actually more closer to five times worse off than the oldest working generation. So now you think about it, Gen Z is going to be forty percent of the global workforce in the next five seven years, five to seven years, right? And so we're going to have a much larger part of the workforce with a dim more diminished capacity to function. And it's not just, like I said, it's not just the mood and outlook. The biggest drop is in a dimension we call the social self, which is how we see ourselves relative to, to others, how we form collaborative bonds. The premise on which human, human progress has happened, that's the biggest uh, impact. So it's, it's, it's these three things, a global decline, an impact on productivity, and uh, the younger generations getting significantly more impacted which I think is the call for action for us. Very uh, profound, uh, Rahul. So in fact, I was um, coming across this news article. Um, I believe in Australia, they are now talking about the right to disconnect, right? So we are so digitally um, hooked all the time, right? So we are always on, and particularly that could have a deep impact on uh, young adolescents. You know, children uh, seem to have attention deficit uh, disorders that are amplified by digital and social self uh, that you spoke about, that's, a, that's an ironic one. While technology connects us all at any point in time, we can connect to anybody in the world. But at the same time, in some countries, we have ministers for loneliness, right? So that's uh, pretty ironic. And as we go along, we'd love to hear a few things that you're working on currently, maybe as a solution to some of these things, right? Um, so uh, moving further along, so a recent survey by the American Psychological Association found that uh, Seventy-nine percent of employees experienced work-related stress in the past year, with thirty-six percent reporting that their workplace uh, is harming their mental health. Right. So you um, uh, bring together a lot of modern science with enduring wisdom, right, to create better ways to work and live. Uh, could you elaborate on what this fusion looks like in practice within the organizational context today? Great, great, great question. Not an easy one, but uh, but I, I, I'll attempt the best answer I could, I could give. Um, so first of all, the statistics that you're mentioning are alarming. They're horrible. Um, and the question I have always asked throughout my 30-year career is why cannot work be joyful? Like, why is it that it needs to be the source of stress and uh, burnout, et cetera, why can't it be joyful? And for much of my career, I have experienced joy and I think I've worked with people that have experienced joy, you have experienced joy. And so why couldn't it, it, it be that? Um, and I think, uh, then you mentioned, you know, kind of the, the wisdom and the, um, uh, and, and the science behind it. And that's exactly how I see it. Uh, the way we have to address it is 
by bringing in the latest science and seeing what that data is showing up and fusing it with what I call the art of high performance or what is the uh, wisdom that has been passed on through the course of human evolution, um, which we can study from you know, tribes that have outlasted others where many others have gotten annihilated. You can see it in different forms of human endeavor. Um, you know, my friend Owen Eastwood's work with elite sports teams around the world, and Owen tells me, you know, the simple conclusion of, you know, the last 15 years of his life is that what separates the highest performing teams from all others is ritualizing high performance. So um, if there's only two things that people take away from this podcast, I would say these are this. First, measure what matters. You cannot manage, as the conventional saying goes, what you can't measure. So first of all, rather than focusing only on the output of performance, which is you know how are people in the top 10%, next 50%, bottom 5%, et cetera, which by the way is completely unscientific and shouldn't exist anyway, but rather than focus on the output of performance, wouldn't it make sense to focus on the conditions that underpin performance, which is mind health? So the first thing people I ad, I'm advocating heavily for organizations to do is know what's going on with your people. And you were one of the people that actually saw this right away and said, well, yes. I want to know what's going on in Northscape. And, and you know, you, it's, it's so creditable um, that, that as an earlier stage company, you actually prioritized it and did it. And to the credit of all the knowledge out there, um, the vast majority of them uh, took this assessment. So measure what matters, find the mind health of your people, how it is impacting your organization today and what you can actually influence and control because there are many things that you can't, but we've studied what organizations can actually control. So that's number one, measure what matters. And two, ritualize high performance behaviors. So why do I say ritualize? It's not something esoteric. Human evolution has shown that rituals are the way we make meaning and we pass on wisdom. And more recent research in Oxford showed us that when rituals are physical, psychological, and communal, as in they have an action or a word that has a meaning for people and is done together rather than alone, it actually increases meaning transfer and group performance. So what should you ritualize? Very simple day-to-day things. You look at Any organization process, every organization at any point in time is recruiting and bringing in new people. They're setting strategy. They're setting annual targets and goals. Uh, They're looking at performance against those targets. Um, So there's a set of organizational performance that goes, they're giving feedback and, 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 and so on, right? So there's a set of organizational processes. Similarly, there are team processes. Every team is bringing people, transitioning people, moving around people. Um, they do team meetings every um, every so often. Um, and so there's a bunch of team processes. What we simply need to do is identify a few moments that are really profound. So when somebody joins an organization and somebody joins a team, it is a huge, huge moment which can set them up for long-term success. So there are a set of things you can do. We see the best organizations and the best teams doing that. Feedback, Um, you know, one of those ubiquitous interactions that the vast majority of uh, organizations get wrong. Why? Because feedback is, let me tell you what you did not do right sometime in the past, or um, this is why you landed in so-and-so place in your performance, right? That's what feedback has eventually become. But what if feedback could actually connect rather than disconnect? So, you know, when you give feedback, if you remind somebody, here's the greatness that I saw in you, here's the skill, the aptitude, the, uh, uh, the qualities that we, uh, we, we saw in you, and that's why we believed you would come and make us better. Well, right now we are not seeing that. Let's try and unpeel what's going on. And when you actually have that conversation, things will emerge. And then you can actually have a personalized set of actions which can help people be their best. So that's what I mean. You can ritualize very simple moments in the flow of work and and set the organization up for great performance, 
while human beings can thrive. So that's the only two things I would say, measure what matters and ritualize high performance. Awesome. Love that, um, Rahul. So that brought to uh, my mind a few examples that I've seen of uh, ritualizing. So my wife was a Googler. And in, I think, the first couple of weeks or months, uh, I'm not sure, uh, they are supposed to be wearing a Noogler hat. That's a new Googler hat. It's a, it's a funny hat, very colorful. And, uh, and if somebody notices a Noogler, obviously, because they are wearing a hat, they are supposed to make them feel welcome and uh, offer help. Right? So that's a great ritual. Right? So when you come into an organization, you feel welcome, you feel the sense of belonging. Right. Uh, in the book, uh, The Culture Code, the author speaks about this as well. You know, belongingness is probably the biggest thing that brings people together to perform uh, into a, it turns them into a high performing team. Right. So uh, that struck, uh, strikes a chord. Uh, something that we used to do at um, Nallscape in the early days is um, when we were small, five, six people, um, uh, anytime we won a deal, we used to ring a bell. And that, that used to happen till we were like, uh, 20, 30 people on the same floor. And then when we grew into two floors, it became a little difficult and all of that. But uh, I still vividly remember the impact that that created. Just the act of ringing a bell, uh, right? Brings everybody together. There is a significance to that uh, little act. Uh, it energizes people uh, physically, mentally, psychologically, and you want to do more of that. Uh, so totally um, get the, the power of uh, rituals that you're speaking about here. So... Um, the, Rajiv, the just, that... just, just, uh, just on that point, I mean, just such amazing examples that you shared, both of these examples. Uh, now, in, in, in the nuclear example, right? So when somebody joins a team, what are the three things that you can actually get right through a simple ritual? You said a sense of belonging. Uh, somebody coming into a new environment, the human brain sees that as a threat. It's a very, yeah. very challenging time when you're actually stepping into a new environment is this for me are these my people am I being judged will I be able to do and that's how you see you know people maybe superstars in in one environment step into another and, and you just don't see that um, so sense of belonging um, accelerating connections amongst people and three clarity of role like yeah. just as as if you can bring people together where everybody talks about their own story um, here's where I come from. This is what I do here. Uh, and, and, and you just go around sharing that. It simply gives clarity of role. These three things, just on the day, the, the first day that, that, that you join, you basically set up the person and the team for long-term success. You don't have to do anything big. And, and I love your example of ringing the bell. I, I, I hope you, you get to ring many, many bells in many, Thank many you. floors around the world. And uh, it's so joyful. Like, you know, when, when uh, I've been to Japanese meditation and, you know, they'll start with a gong. So there's something yeah. about ringing a bell that's just uh, uh, so lovely. Yeah, it sort of focuses the attention of uh, people. I think that's the purpose of a bell in any case. So um, the World Economic Forum uh, recently reported that 35% of employees globally are working remotely or in hybrid roles. I would have thought it's a much higher number, but 35% is what they're saying. And this has introduced new mental health challenges. Even this conversation around rituals, how does that translate um, in a hybrid work environment or a remote work environment, right? So how do leaders still do this in a virtual setup? Yeah, it's a, it's, they, they, I've given a lot of thought to this. And um, unfortunately, this is another debate, I think, which is just premised on very wrong ends of the spectrum. And, you know, one end of the spectrum is do your work wherever you can and in whichever way you can. And we care about work getting done. So if you can do it from home or a coffee shop or, you know, and sitting on an island, we don't care. That's fine. Okay. That's one end of the spectrum. The other end of the spectrum is we need to see you three days a week in, th in this office. And then what happens in the office? You, you come into the office and people are sitting in their cubicles and on their desks and those offices have not changed for you know many many years and then they're getting on to uh, teams and zoom calls with other people that are in any case working uh, remotely so how do either of these make make any sense so what i believe um, this time is requiring us to do is get intentional about work structuring so my premise is if anything can be done virtually, 
we don't require people to commute and come to the office uh, and, uh, and 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 have to you know uh, inconvenience themselves and and do all of that if it can any way be done virtually. So let that happen and let's create the space and time for people to do deep work. Let's you know give the, the a number of hours where people can just block off and whatever they're doing and, and and do it virtually. But the second part, social connections in our research in our very large scale database that we are seeing social relationships, meaning relationships with work colleagues, relationships with your manager, being in the flow of communication, these three things have a huge bearing on mental health and on performance. Um, now, the virtual world is not conducive to that as, as best as you can try that. So what if you were to architect work such that you're bringing people together purposefully for the purpose of social connection, for the purpose of creativity. Uh, and when you actually do that, you can actually architect in a way to say, for this kind of a function, let's earmark once every quarter or once every month people coming together. But when they come together, there is no other distraction. There are no other calls scheduled. There's no other, there's no other stuff going on. You're very, very intentional about, about doing that. And so bringing people together, I think really, really matters. And then the third thing I would say is we cannot be stuck in any paradigms of the past um, and expect to build culture, like saying, you know, be in the office three days a week because that's how we've all built our careers, et cetera. Well, a lot has changed uh, and, and, and you don't need to do that. But bringing people, if you're bringing people to the office, then restructure the office so, so that it actually fosters greater human friction and creativity. And I mean friction in a positive way. I mean, there's a reason yeah. Apple designed their, uh, th their campus as a, as a home button because it's just designed for people to constantly run into each other in, in non-functional you know, in, in non, uh, interactions. You're just running into people and that's what fosters creativity and that's, how, you know, that's been the hallmark of Apple anyway. And to that point, there is merit in bringing the office closer to people rather than always bringing people to the office. So there's, there's merit in thinking about pod-like offices. And I would distinguish that from co-working spaces. Co-working spaces, not pod-like offices, but pod-like offices, which may be closer to where people are, because one of the things we've all seen all around the world is that when the pandemic happened, people dispersed out of metro right. cities and you know they went to other parts and they would prefer to be there some are still staying there but so what if you could have pod like offices wherever there are reasonable concentrations of people and let them come together over there have more kind of hyper local teams than always globally distributed teams um, and so there's there's merit in uh, being intentional about work structuring and the answer will be different for every organization for every industry and so on uh, but i think there's merit in prioritizing virtual work where it, um, it, it to the extent it makes sense, fostering social connections as it makes sense, and then being intentional about bringing people together for the purpose of creativity and, uh, and, um, and innovation uh, and doing that more locally. So those are my thoughts about, uh, about this. And you know, to your point on remote workers, our database tells us that people that are working entirely remotely have actually uh, far lower uh, mental health outcomes than those that are not. So I think it it merits a relook. I love that. So um, you speak a lot about aligning work with individual purpose. I think you were referencing this earlier as well. How do you personally stay aligned with your purpose? And how do you guide others to do the same? And I want to add um, an angle of digital and AI to this, right? So a large part of our identity is related to the work we do, right? And today there seems to be a lot of automation going on and uh, this conversation around AI and the, the out of the possible with that and what might happen to what we do, let's say five years from now, uh, right? So when you think about all of that and an individual purpose and how that guides um, or gets aligned with organizational purpose, uh, how do you do that firstly for yourself and how do you inspire others to uh, stay connected to their purpose? Purpose is um, is a is a is a huge huge um, aspect of of our beings, 
Um, and my thoughts have been evolving on purpose and I've actually kind of rephrased purpose to meaning. Um, and I think about meaning more and, and, and I, I think about it in kind of a few ways. So um, first is, am I connected to something that is bigger than me? And, and this is the reason I'm kind of distinguishing it. Uh, I, in, in, in parts of our, 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 our culture, we've started to over rotate on the individual part of purpose. And human evolution shows us that, um, that progress and survival have a lot more to do with people that connect to a purpose larger than themselves, that, that feel they're part of something that is bigger than us. Um, and so that's why I, I, I'm thinking more about meaning uh, to kind of distinguish it from the individual to, the, uh, to, some, to something bigger. Um, what we are seeing, uh, I mentioned um, relationships, the social aspect, but what we are seeing is meaning has a bigger impact on well-being than even things like flexibility and workload do. Very interesting to see that. So when we feel we are connected to, uh, to something that's bigger than us, when we feel that what we do is being valued by people we serve, our customers and so on, uh, and what we are doing is actually good for society, like it's, it's it, it, the, my work contributes to, to, to betterment, that has a huge impact on um, mental well-being. It has a huge impact on our ability to perform and go go well beyond what whatever we think we could do. So, um, so that's that's the evolution of my thoughts. Uh, for me, it's very simple. Um, you know, because I had um, experiences in, in in my life where um, you know when I look back at it as. Uh, it's quite a miracle that I'm still here talking to you, uh, and uh, it it showed me that it could only be because I was I, I was here to do something beyond beyond myself, um, and that has led me to every single decision I made uh, about what I do. Uh, you know, leaving India uh, and having to to be outside, and then uh, taking on bigger and bigger responsibilities. The motivation was well, I'm here to help people thrive. I'm that's why I do what I do. Uh, it it is what led me out uh, to 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 not pursue the career that I thought I would pursue and in in doing the work that I'm doing today, um, and so there's a little voice that's there in all of us um, that just tells us, uh, and having an an ongoing connection with that voice, cultivating that connection um, in whichever way um, comes naturally to us. I think is how we connect to a bigger meaning and, and how we stay grounded and how we can guide ourselves. So you talked about technology and AI and here's the only thing that I'll say about that. Yeah, sure, it's gonna change everything. It already is. I use chat GPT just like everybody else does. Um, we've, I was talking to, uh, to, to a, a friend who's, uh, who's founded a new company and so on. He's like, I feel like I've got a person sitting right next to me and I would have reached out to so many people, but I'm constant, it's just, it, it, it's 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 doing the work of a real human being uh, for me. Great, that's fantastic. Let's just continue to harvest and do that and uh, save all the uh, the energy that we can in doing so. But let's be clear: technology is not going to solve human problems. Humans are going to solve human problems. There's no doubt in my mind about that. There is no app that is going to make you better. There is no variable that's going to make you better. Because what you need to be better, what I need to be better is already resident within. So what if we got curious about this human mind, body, and spirit as we are curious about technology? What if you were to just cultivate that curiosity? I think many answers would come, uh, come from there. And that's my simple belief. So Rahul, just over the weekend, I was reading this book uh, called uh, The Inner Game of Tennis. I don't know if you've read this book. Uh, it's uh, yeah. I've, it caught my attention because it's part of Bill Gates' uh, list of uh, recommended books. It was outstanding because uh, he talks about that inner voice that you just referenced, and how uh, inside all our all of our heads, at every minute, uh, every instance, you you have that voice telling you something. Oops, that didn't go well, or you didn't say this right, or what will other people think? You know, there's constantly that chatter that's going on, 
and he talks about high performance basically right o on the tennis court when you're playing the game and it's a crunch situation what are you telling yourself or what are you hearing uh, through your inner voice and can you make that go silent because your body knows what needs to be done you've practiced that shot a million times and poor performance ends up happening because there is an interruption to that flow the state of flow so he basically talks about meditation he talks about how to quieten that thing that inner voice right um, you know and you need to let go and trust your your practice your system that you have put in um, so a lot of what you said resonated uh, with me because I've just finished that book and I was like, what a fantastic book. And you're pretty much saying the same thing. That's awesome. Uh, Rajiv, can one... I make a real, re real quick follow up to that because you yeah. brought up tennis uh, and, and it's a beautiful thing you said, uh, which is in a game, which is very physical, the, what separates the, the, the highest performers from others is their connection with their inner self and that's the the inner mastery that they have to practice as much right. as they do but there's something else uh, that 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 is really profoundly informing the highest level of performers so when you see Novak Djokovic win yeah. the gold medal where does he turn to first the first place he's looking at is his box when he wins the championship or even when he loses the championship. And um, I saw this in Wimbledon recently when, when he lost to Carlos uh, Alcaraz. Uh, and not only did he congratulate um, Carlos, he actually congratulated the, the team. So yes. even in the most individual of sports, none of us stand alone. None of us can do this alone. It's always the team that gets us there. Sure, there's a beacon that's out there in the center and it feels like a very individual sport, but it's always a team. And so this is, that's why meaning and, 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 and relationships will always come to the fore. This inner connection that we need to cultivate and it's the connection with others. And those are the two kind of keys to the secrets, um, I, I, I think, to great human performance that, that we need to be cultivating and be mindful of awesome that's that's fantastic so um coming back to the organizational context right so uh, you you've done uh, this survey many millions of people have used it um and i know you have a framework around it as well right now to help organizations sort of um you know take some some steps towards uh, prioritizing mental health can you throw some light on what that framework actually is and what do uh, companies actually do uh, once they know that the survey is uh, revealing certain truths. What do they do about it? Yeah, yeah, great question. So um, uh, I I have very small brain answers to everything. So I have to just, you know, boil that down to the simplest thing. So I think there are three things. Uh, the framework is very simple. It's assess, understand, act. Um, so like I said earlier, you can't manage what you can't measure. So know in your organization, how are your people doing? Um, and know that in as nuanced ways as you can by function, by region, by roles, and so on. Two, what is, how is it impacting your performance today, the mind health? Uh, what's, what's the impact today? You need to be able to quantify it. And um, if it is material, then it requires you to do something about it. Um, and, and three, what is in your control? There are many things about um, uh, about the human condition that are outside of the four walls of an organization. You can't inform, you can't influence people's families or friendships and so on, but there's a set of things you can influence. So what are they? And for your specific organization, how do they get prioritized in order of magnitude? So you assess, then you understand very specifically for your organization. For instance, um, you may be an organization that has cafeterias and serving food. When we do our assessment, uh, we might be able to say, well, um, we can see a very strong correlation between um, uh, the food people are consuming and their yeah. mental health. What if you were to just change your menu? As simple as that. Or uh, in another organization, we might say, what we are seeing is that there's a pretty direct correlation between um, how you're managing performance and how it's impacting people. Well, then let's take a relook at this and revisit the fundamentals um, on which you premise that because just by doing those things, you might be able to change it. So um, that's the three-step framework. Assess, 
understand in very specific data-led evidence uh, based way and then act and act is very simple ritualize what will create great performance you don't need to have massive culture transformations and big change programs and all of that no the biggest unit of impact that i have seen in my career is the team it's not the enterprise level it's not the individual level it's teams what if we could simply empower teams with you know seven to nine uh, uh, behaviors that they can ritualize when somebody joins a leave, uh, team and somebody leaves a team when they're setting goals uh, when you're setting uh, when you're giving feedback maybe just you know a few things you need to do and if you were to ritualize that learning from what the best in class do just by ritualizing those you've set yourself up for performance so that's my kind of simple three-step framework and i think the answers again to doing this are pretty simple and they're pretty human right so rahul we know that there's a big gap between knowing and doing and as learning professionals uh, we we understand that some of these concepts you know cognitively even if you get it to convert that into practice um, requires discipline, it requires focus, um, you know, the ability to deal with distractions and a whole lot of things, right? So what is your superpower? What, what helps you stay on course? And uh, yeah, that's uh, part one of the question. Part two is there is also a sense that, you know, uh, this is like going to the gym or anything. After some time, it becomes routine, right? And you might lose interest in this, right? Is there anything new that you do in the space that uh, keeps the excitement alive for you? Yeah, it's, um, you know, every time I think about superpower, I, um, it's, it's, uh, it's good to remind yourself that for every superpower, there's a shadow power. So each one of us <laughs> in the package deal, you know, we, we, we do th think things, things really well. Um, I tend to, I think uh, my superpowers in this are really, I, I try and, you know, boil it down to the simplest thing that people can do something about. And I try and communicate it as succinctly, as impactfully as possible. Uh, I, I keep in mind that people have extremely busy lives, so I try and condense it in, in, in as few words as, as I can. That's why I started a video series uh, on, on human expansion uh, a year ago uh, with, you know, three to five minute uh, videos with, based on everything we were learning from the science and art of high performance. I'll try and continue to do that. Um, the, you know, to me, I, I think the there's a kind of loop that I've put myself in, which is, um, first of all, continuing to cultivate that inner voice and what does it say? Because like you said, distractions come. Uh, even in my journey of the last 18 months or so, um, I, um, you know, there are always the distractions of, well, somebody approaches you and says, well, why don't you do this role? It's, you know, it's a, it's a big one. It could be very, very interesting and uh, you're just perfect for it and you're distracted. And I say, oh yeah, yeah, maybe I could, I could do that. But then just the, you know, cultivating that inner voice and following that energy and says, what am I here for? And then you tune that out and say, I have to focus on this and it's not an easy path and it's not a straightforward path, but that's, that, that's what I'm here for. Um, and then second, I think um, joy, like doing this joyfully and with people that fill you up, I think is really important. And uh, uh, in the biggest arenas and the smallest teams that I've been part of, um, I seek to be around people that inspire me and have very different uh, um, superpowers from me. Uh, you know, right now, my immediate circle consists of a small group of world-class scientists, uh, high-performance coaches, uh, organizational transformation experts, uh, and, um, uh, and, and they come at things very, very differently uh, than I do. And uh, that's very joyful for me. And so I, I, I need to find joy in everyday work and, and be fueled by it because... Uh, as you know, as uh, as an entrepreneur, uh, Rajiv, uh, way, way more than I know at this point, um, uh, there are many challenges. It's not an easy journey, and uh, and none of us are going to do this alone. So, uh, so we need to to find people that will fill us up and egg us on through the through the journey. Awesome, those are great words, um, Rahul. So that brings us to the close of this podcast, and uh, to all our viewers and listeners, when Rahul and I get together. Um, we've always gone um, on with our conversation for four hours, five hours and six hours. And this has just been an hour so far, right? So this is an unusual conversation from that perspective that it's only an hour. Uh, so that's how much we share with each other. And um, there's so much uh, commonality and uh, shared sense of purpose. 
always a pleasure interacting with you rahul i learn so much every time i speak to you thank you so much for your great insights um and um and for those of you who have not um checked out his videos please please do watch them a very insightful and also check out uh, sapien labs um they're doing some cutting edge work in the space of mental health so thanks to all our viewers and listeners for tuning in to the learning curve we shall be back in the next episode with another great personality and insights on making organizations leaders and the workforce ready for the future until next time take care and goodbye thank you so much rahul one more time thank you very much and uh, rajiv all the best to you keep doing the amazing work that you do and inspiring all the people that are fortunate to come by you thank you thank you so much rahul